This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Noah Tishby, who is the New York Times best-selling author. She's the former special envoy for combating anti-Semitism for the State of Israel, and she is an actress and producer. She'll be, she'll be known to many of you as the author of Israel, A Simple Guide to the Most Misunderstood Country on Earth. So, Noah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So, Noah, let, let's begin with the, 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 the day that the world transformed for the darker. I mean, for me, if I think back to October the 6th, I almost can't remember what it was like. It feels like a, a, another lifetime, a million years ago. How did that day change? I mean, for one thing, that day and everything that came since, was it, was it a surprise to you? How did it change your thinking? Well, um, so it was about 8.30 uh, p.m. in Los Angeles, and I got a call, a FaceTime call from my sister from Israel, and it was puzzling to me because it was Shabbat dinner, and I was with my son in my friend's house, and I was wondering why is she FaceTiming me at 6.30 in the morning on Shabbat? Mm -hmm. So I picked up the phone, and she was like, well, this is weird. She was like, this is really weird. Like, we have a lot of rockets and a lot of, like, explosions all over. This is not as usual. Um the night unfolded such that I uh, pretty quickly got a notice that there's a ground invasion. And for some bizarre reason, I knew what this was. And the reason I knew what this, I mean, obviously I didn't know what this was because none of us could have imagined the, um, the barbarity of which how the day unfolded. But we always knew that a big attack is coming. And I, you know, we always knew that the repercussions are going to be grave, not just in terms of the actual attack, but in terms of the reaction, the worldwide reaction. So I went back. I First of all, we were the first ones to post anything on social media before the American media said anything about it, before anybody knew what was going on. I posted a video uh, with the terrorists uh, that have invaded Shdirot, and I said, this is a uh, it's rockets, but it's not actually that. It's an it's under the guise of rockets. There's land invasion that's happening right now, and we were the first ones to report on this. I um, less than an hour after the attack is when I posted the first video. Uh, then I promptly took my son back home and put him to bed, and we went live on Instagram, and wow. we broadcast live for about. I don't even know how many hours, three, four, five, six. I have no idea, but we stayed up for a very long time. I was broadcasting live everything that was happening as it was unfolding. Um, what I was getting from both from Israeli media, but also from people on the ground. So we were the first ones to report about the Nova festival because I have a good friend who had many friends uh, at the festival and she was getting text messages from them on the spot. So and it feels so Instagram, like so all your so your Instagram your Instagram fans were were watching live as yeah. you're broadcasting through the night. Did you see? Do you know the audience numbers? I mean, do you see it go up and down, or have you got any idea? Of it was in the thousands. I'm not entirely. I'm yeah. not entirely sure. It was very erratic. It was. I was. You know just wearing a t-shirt from Shabbat dinner with like no, you know, it was, it was very erratic and very stressy, mm. obviously. And very, very, it was, it was, uh, it was horrible. It, I, I was reporting on things that I wasn't, I remember for the first time that I'm, it, it came up, um, that some of the kibbutzim and the settlements, uh, not the settlements, the kibbutzim, the moshavim, the, the little villages in the South were, uh, taken, and I was like, they're captured? What does that even mean? They're captured. So under siege by Hamas, they're taken by Hamas. You know, so it was just the whole night was surreal and horrific. We went to sleep at, I don't know, I can't remember what time, maybe five o'clock in the morning for a couple of hours, a nightmares, and then woke up and been basically uh, on the entire time. Sadly, um, this did not, October 7th and October 8th, because I call it the atrocities of October 7th and the atrocities of October 8th. So there is what happened, the massacre, and then there's the world's reaction to what happened. Did not surprise me at all. Um, we have been, and I, I say we because it's not enough people, but we were a handful of activists and a handful of uh, organizations that have tried to warn the Jewish community that an iceberg is heading our way. Like we're heading to an iceberg basically, um, which was comprised from uh, the, the barbaric enemy that Israel has on its borders. That is um, 
committed to its annihilation and the slaughter of and the genocide of the Jewish people. There's no, other, you know, when somebody tells you who they are, believe them the first time. That's what they say. These jihadis, um, terrorists say, say they're not trying to hide what it is that they want. That coupled with the West's useful idiots that have been brainwashed against Israel and the Jewish people for decades without the Jewish community noticing it or doing anything about it. So this coming through Al Jazeera, AJ Plus, it's coming through ethnic studies in high schools, it's coming through SJPs on campuses, it's coming through a trillion dollars that some entities have paid uh, in the past 10 years to soft power, changing the hearts and minds of American um, youth. And we knew this was happening. We knew what was going on on campuses. We knew, I, I, I wrote about it in my book. I wrote about it in op-eds. We've, we've talked about this a lot. So that allowed me after October 7th to jump into action because, and you, you can see this in the lives that I've posted because that particular live, by the way, I never posted it. I kind of turned my phone off and went to sleep and it disappeared into the ether. And I wow. wish I had live because of other reasons, but I, that, that live I took offline, but the other ones, I very quickly knew that this is generational. I knew that this is epic on a, I, it was one of those things that I kept saying, okay, listen, listen, Jews, <laughs> our grandparents were right and tag your it. And it's our time and it's happening. Everything that they said that is going to happen at some point is happening right now, because the truth of the matter is even if there was a massacre of a million Jews in Israel, the brainwashed people in the West that have uh, been taught to believe uh, that the Jews, for example, are colonizer in their indigenous land, right, um, would not bat an eyelash and they would be okay with that. And that is something that we need to, as a community, understand that this is the new reality that we're at. It's not that the reality is new, is that the people are aware of it now and do whatever it is that yeah. we can to fight it. But it was I mean, there, it, it, been there for many, many, many years. So it wasn't, to right. answer your question, sadly, I was not surprised. I mean, one of the observations that I had after after October the 7th was that it felt to me a bit, a bit uh, different. It felt like a reversal because normally in history, I mean, the pogrom is nothing new for us in terms of our DNA, our cultural memory. You know, this is nothing new. Um, but what felt like was new was that in the past, a sort of everyday anti-Semitic bigotry reached a crescendo of bloodlust and, and massacre. Whereas in this case, it feels like a crescendo of bloodlust and massacre gave way to everyday bigotry all over the world. It felt like it went the other way around somehow. Not necessarily, because remember before October 7th, there was Kanye West. <laughs> right. Before October but, 7th, there was already a ton of anti-Semitism. You, all you needed to do was actually listen to every single college, Jewish college campus kid in the recent 15 years. And they've been trying to tell us that they're ostracized, marginalized, demonized, and pushed aside and being taken yeah. out of kind of like, you know, the cool crowds. So it's not new at true. all just didn't take it seriously. And people would be, say stuff like, well, it's just Kanye West, he's crazy. And I'm like, no, I mean, sure he is obviously. And I feel for his children, but also, mm -hmm. no, this is, I, I have seen that shift uh, happening through uh, the crowds that I've been hanging out with. So I live and work in Los Angeles, in Hollywood. I was hanging out with people that were woke before there was a name for it, like legit. Uh, and I, noticed this change a, a long time ago, 10, 15, 20, you know, whatever, 15 years ago of, of, pe of people becoming really weird, <laughs> like moving from like kind of like a progressive liberal left to crazy town. And I saw how the Jewish community has thrown under the bus and how Israel is thrown under the bus in the most aggressive and blood libelous ways. And I'm talking about things that happened like 10 years and more. So I saw the conversation around Israel specifically. And to me, it's very obvious as an Israeli American that when you're obsessing over a tiny country in the Middle East, more than you're obsessing over bigger and worse countries in the world, when you literally all your energy and focus is put on that country, there's a bit more to it than just yeah, yeah. 
of disagreement with uh, Israeli government. And again, I was able to see this because I'm Israeli. So I moved to America and I'm like, why are you all obsessing over my country? What's right. wrong with you? And I, I was mean, able fact, to I mean, identify, it, um, to identify yeah, I mean, what it is, which is, you know, under, <laughs> it's like subconscious anti-Semitism. So what I was what I was saying is that I I saw the conversation shift within that kind of progressive crowd about Israel from um, politics, policies, borders, politicians, which is totally legitimate. Like, I don't like what Israel's doing in this policy or the other, right? To mm -hmm. something that sounded kind of like, yeah, but like, is Israel, like, is it an actual state though? Or maybe it's like a colonialist endeavor. It needs to be dismantled. And I was like, wait, what is that? And I've heard that years and years and years ago. And I knew that the crowds that I'm hearing this from are the elites and that it trickles down. So- right happened October 7th, all it did, meaning October 8th, was activation time and activation moment for horrible, horrible undercurrent situations that have been going on for decades. And the Jewish community were just blind to it. We basically were right. asleep. We thought we're good. We thought we're assimilated. We thought the Jews are accepted and we thought anti-semitism is done um frankly that was me too when i was living in israel i thought i was people are still anti-semitic but we what all that happened is that it became more public and the jewish community and and normal people around the world um right i mean i think right. like it, it, it what i was trying to say is that i feel like i mean i knew about where it was on campus and and uh, in, in um, you know, basically anywhere on the left is where the foothold of anti-Semitism is these days. And I don't say right. that with, with extreme any... Extreme right and extreme left any... unite in the right. Extreme right. Yeah, right. although I think, I think, in, I think in, in the UK, the extreme right is much more muted than it is in, in the States. But either way, yeah. um, but I think that the way in which it, the way in which it became, I mean, now Jewish people are living with marches every weekend with anti-Semitic graffiti, with with attacks. It's everywhere, you know, the in our personal lives, attitudes, stuff that we come across. But if we just restrict it to where it's coming from, i.e. the elites, can you anatomize for us what's been going on? Where does all this stuff come from? How do we get to this place where this thing was just waiting for October 7th to explode? Well, what do you mean just from the elites? Well, I mean, from the, I mean, what you use the word woke. So in terms of campus culture, in terms of the the passing off of anti-Semitism as a virtuous, progressive ideology that's part of the worldview of people who reckon that they are the most enlightened people in society and want to impose that enlightened view on everybody else. Mm -hmm. How did it become part of that worldview? Well, it's not new again and history historically that's not new that anti-semitism is coming from the left the thing the the thing that to me is ironic um and would have been funny if it wouldn't have been so horrible is that those uh young uh elites those young progressives that see themselves as the social justice warriors of the entire universe and see themselves as the ones that carry the torch and they see themselves as the ones that are speaking truth to power they see themselves as the ones that are taking down the patriarchy like oh my god we're so you know there's a sense of um self a grand like a grandiose and 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 self-centeredness that i'm here to save the world but what they're actually doing is picking on the most picked on minority in the entire world and for thousands of years. So it's literally, you think you're speaking truth to power, but speaking actual speaking actual truth to power and actually taking down the patriarchy has a cost, has a price. What they're doing right now has no price because picking on Jews is the easiest thing in the world. So this is also something that we need to identify and see and stand up against. But I gotta tell you in terms of the demonstrations, right? For example, I don't think we should fight against them at all. In fact, there's this uh, saying that you don't uh, you don't stop your enemy from making a mistake, right? Right. I don't think we should go against them at all. In fact, we should incur let them continue happening because the more they take down British flags, the more they take down American flags, the more aggressive they are, the more covered their faces, the more they spray paint, the more they're calling for, for anarchy, the more the silent majority of the world, which I really don't think the silent majority is anti-Semitic. I think the silent majority is kind of in the middle and sitting there watching, right? In America and in Europe is going to begin to understand what it is that we're dealing with here. 
And we need to allow the world to see that. So I am all about being defiant, right? I will never take down my star of David. I'm walking around with the thing. I took the yellow pin of the hostages and I pinned it at every person I saw at a Los Angeles magazine event a couple of days ago. Like I am Miss Defiance, right? But when it comes to these demonstrations, go ahead, go demonstrate, go riot in the streets, show us who you are. That's totally fine. The more posters you rip down of children that have been hostage and, and are kidnapped, the more the world can actually see what it is that we're dealing with, which is not a progressive movement. It's not a social justice movement. It's an anti-Semitic movement that has been infiltrated by nefarious forces and taken to literally, in order to literally take down the single consistent democracy in the Middle East. So these right. are forces that are, that are, it's paid for, it's organized by, and it's planned and coordinated for decades by countries and forces that want to take Israel down. And they're doing everything, by all means necessary. So the more we right. allow it to hold and show it, the better it is for uh, not just the Jewish community, but normal society and Western values as a whole. And now let's talk about the um, Jews who get caught up in this. And it's difficult being being Jewish and, at, and on campus, but particularly if you're Jewish at campus and on the left yourself, you're surrounded yeah. by anti-Semitism in the politics that you would otherwise belong by the to. Way, those kids on college campus are the first ones that have tried to tell us this for like years. Right. They're the ones right, going, right, hey, guys, right. you have no idea what's happening here on campus. Like I can't be a part of the gay club because I'm right. supporting Israel. And they tried exactly. to tell us this is happening. And there was the attitude in like the old guard and kind of like the, the you know, the the legacy organization that are like, well, they get out of college and it'll, be, you know, it'll, it'll go away. But it doesn't because if you combine yeah. ethnic studies that is calling for to decenter the West, right? So you don't teach about, you know, you teach that colonialism is the source of all evil and like granted colonialism is, was terrible, but also you, it, it's it, you can't. Israel is it was decolonized from Great Britain, like literally. If right. you're against colonialism, it's like the best land back experiment experience ever in the history of the world. If you're bundling up Israel into that, you have ethnic studies in um, in 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 high schools where you don't teach about World War II or the Holocaust. You decenter the West, and then you couple that with BDS activations on campus, calling for it, like constantly saying apartheid, apartheid, genocide, 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 genocide. Then by the time, and you're voting on these like BDS resolutions that mean nothing on campus, but all they do is they train the, the younger kind of voting, the, the next generation of voters that, oh, well, I voted for that on campus and it's okay to vote for it in city hall and it's okay to vote for it in Congress later on. Right, and that's right, right. For a very, very long time. And we have to nip But we do back. see, right, but we do see a number of Jews who go over to that side of the argument, who become yeah. to a various degrees, um, you know, anti-Israel, make that side big, because they seem to hold their political allegiances so dear, that comes first almost. And I feel yeah. like sometimes, you know, they they find, they say, you, know, you hear about it a lot, people who are kind of towards that end of the spectrum saying things like, of course I defend Israel's right to exist, but, and then what comes after that kind of undermines the the first part of the statement. But what do you sure. think about those guys? Where do well, they come I, from and, and what's going on? I think that the Jewish community, uh, a lot of uh, uh, individuals from the Jewish community have always tried to be liked by others. So it's kind of like a pathology that the Jews, we've had this for generations. This goes back to the days of the Hellenism in Israel, where the Jews were uh, working out really hard and like re-sewed their foreskins in order to become more Greeks than the Greeks, right? When you look at Herzl, that lit like he thought the solution for the Jews was to convert, right? And then he's like, oh, wait a second. We can convert out of it, but they're never going to let us convert out of it. And this is showing up right now with anti-Zionist Jews that are either saying um, that that are going all the way to say that Israel shouldn't exist. And to me, it's just it's heartbreaking because they think that by that they're saving themselves. And they think that by that they're going to be accepted in the cool crowd. And uh, first of all, they won't. And second, they are betraying everything that they are. And the Jewish community as a whole, every Jew is a survivor, right? The fact that we're still here is mind boggling. 
It makes no sense that we're still here. None whatsoever. Like statistically, it's impossible, right? So we have a responsibility. And a part of being born Jewish, you cannot dis like you cannot detach yourself as a Jew from the land of Israel. Like the Jewish religion and culture and tradition, Judaism in and of itself is an indigenous religion that is inseparable from a place. Like we are the ultimate indigenous people, right? And for people like that, for, for these Jews to turn and be like, I don't care about Israel at all. I don't need Israel. Israel has nothing to do with me. I'm like, well, good luck with that. It's very sad, but also ironic and not new because these Jews think that they are they're trying, it's kind of like in a mean girl, in a mean girl's kind of way. You're trying to like suck up to like the, you know, the, the queen bee of the class and being like, I'm just like you, I'm totally cool. I'm a, I'm a good Jew. I'm a good Jew. I hate yeah. Israel. I'm a good Jew. And um, it's just, it never, it never works. So may as well stand your ground, be defiant, sink your heels in the ground and, you know, just, just resist that attempt. And it feels to me as if sometimes, um, there's a sort of opening for expressing these sorts of anti-Zionist ideas through the medium of criticizing the Israeli government. Mm -hmm. Now, the Israeli government, of course, you know, is worthy of criticism in many ways, which I don't need to tell you about. By the way, every government is worthy like... of criticism. Right. Literally, and, every government it feels, is worthy. It feels to me like you, you, you so often hear people saying, oh, the Netanyahu government are this and they're that, and they're running the war in this way, they're doing this and the other, but actually the same criticisms that are being leveled at Israel now are the same that were leveled by other governments in other wars in other times. And so it yeah. feels to me as if that's, in a way, it's just a way of articulating that kind of criticism, yeah. um, you know, so and, and vocalizing I, that. I have the great greatest example of this. So again, I've been a pro-Israel activist for the better part of the last 15 years. Uh, uh, most of it under the Netanyahu government, some of it not. I also was appointed as a special envoy for combating anti-Semitism and delegitimization by the for former government, the Lapid Bennett government, um, or Bennett Lapid. Bennett was the prime minister. Yay, Lapid was the foreign minister, and he appointed me as uh, the special envoy. Now, in my years of Israel advocacy, right, around the Lapid Bennett government, that was what's called the good government, right? It was left, right, center, Arab parties. Like it was yeah. a, a collaborative government. It was a boring government in the best sense of the world. Nobody heard from them. They were working. It was, there was no drama. There was no, you know. And I was thinking, well, surely the activist crowd in America is going to now back off from Israel, right? Nothing. Zero difference. Zero difference. So you are 100% right as much. And then obviously I was fired by the Netanyahu government. So, you know, I'm yeah. like, I continued my advocacy work regardless with the title, without the title, it's irrelevant for me, but you can't right. call me a pawn of any Israeli government. I don't work yeah. for the government. And I, even when I did work for the government, I didn't get paid for the government. And I knew to criticize Israel's government's actions or proposed actions when I needed to, right? But neither government made a difference. So this is not at all about Netanyahu. Not and even a little. Not exactly. even a little. And, and funny enough, like, I was thinking it's back. I was excuse, thinking it's literally an excuse to take Israel down because of brainwashed and undercurrent of and, and subconscious biases against the Jewish people that you that it, that is coupled with an active campaign to to take Israel down and again, to brand Israel the worst, the, the most devilish creature in the Middle East is yeah. so ridiculous because we know it's done in order to distract from the actual atrocities that are happening in the Middle East. Right, you know? I mean, I was thinking I was thinking back actually to 2021, which was the last time that we had a kind of, it wasn't a war, it was a, it was a, it was a conflict. And at that time we had in Britain, we had 180,000 people coming out in Hyde Park and demonstrating, we had, open anti-Semitism in the streets. We had a convoy, I don't know if you saw this, a convoy of, of men shouting about how they were going to rape Jewish women and daughters out yeah. the car as they drove through. And that was because 256 Palestinians were killed, about half of them terrorists. So let's not say that this sort of stuff is proportionate or is linked to Israel's actions. And again, this happened on May 11th, 2021, and it started by rockets fired by Hamas onto Israel. So right. I, I mean- right. Right. This is right. nothing but excuses. While, while, the, while the Syrian civil war passed 500,000 casualties. Of yes. course. Yeah. 
And we, I, I mean, it's, I'm not even talking uh, like China and Iran and Venezuela yeah. and South America and Mexico and the cartels. And the, there's so many horrific things that are happening around the world and people are obsessing over Israel. And again, this is something that now is obviously this is, yeah, it's becoming very apparent, but uh, was very clear as an Israeli American moving here as a young, young adult looking around going, you're all, why are you looking at us with such a magnifying glass? I'm not sure. Right. I understand. You know? So let's talk on that note. Let's, let's talk, let's talk, um, let's talk politics a little bit. I mean, Chuck Schumer is perhaps an example of that. I mean, he's, he's Jewish and he made those extraordinary comments calling basically almost for regime change um, in, in, in Israel a couple of weeks ago. And today we had the, uh, vote at the Security Council in favor of a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. And the U.S., for the first time I can remember, abstained and allowed it to go through. What does all this say about the U.S.-Israel relationship? Look, this is not uh, not great. I'm about to go on uh, an Israeli media again and, and give a bit of an analysis on that. It's definitely not great. Uh, the United States is losing patience with the war that we knew is going to be hard. Uh, we're fighting against a vicious enemy, unlike any other enemy um, on earth, an enemy that is willing to massacre babies in their cribs and rape women next to their family. It's really, it's, it's unfathomable. Look, War is a horrible thing, um, but in in the context of this anti-Semitic world that we live in right now, a justified war, which is a horrific war, and no war is great, all wars are disastrous, but a justified war that Israel didn't start and didn't want had turned into a genocide in terms of the perception. People th relate to it as a genocide, which is an insane liable, a completely insane liable. Um, I hope that the uh, Israeli government will actually re realign themselves and readjust themselves. I trust the friendship between Israel and uh, and the United States more than I trust uh, current leadership on every side, right? On the Republicans and Democrats and the Israelis and whatever. The, the, the bond between Israel and America is of values and of intentionality and of protection of that region, of the safety and security of that region. So in the long term, I am not worried. In the short term, this is obviously um not ideal and it's not what the region needs do you feel like the um the americans are uh do you think do you think it's, it's about the upcoming elections in november do you think the americans really mean what they say in terms of cutting off support like actual practical sport and arms sales i think that uh as as the saying goes all politics is local so I think obviously you can't look at what's happening. Both uh, Donald Trump, Chuck Schumer, Joe Biden, Benjamin Netanyahu, Benny Gant, everybody involved uh, is uh, uh, not just looking at outside, but also looking at their own base. So there's no question about that. I obviously wouldn't dare guessing uh, uh, if if any of these threats or veiled threats will um, happen. I would venture to say that they won't. I obviously think that they shouldn't. And uh, I guess we'll wait and see. But all politics is local. I mean, so there's no doubt that all everybody involved, every single people person uh, involved is also looking at their own base when they make decisions. And, and if, they make right. And, and if, if those threats did come to pass, if America stopped the flow of arms, if Israel was boycotted and sanctioned and isolated, if the worst came to pass in terms of the international community, what would happen then? It would be horrible, but I trust the Israeli people to make decisions based on based on that as well. So Israel is a democracy; it's a flourishing democracy. It's such a it's such a it's so democratic. It's almost almost ungovernable, as we've seen in the past um, in the past few years. I hope this doesn't happen. Look, there's already uh, sanctions, and there are already boycotts, and it's already been unpopular to be uh, to be an Israeli in many many circles around the world. So this is not something new. But hopefully, you know, the attempt to brand Israel an apartheid state like South Africa is an attempt that we need to make sure doesn't happen because it's not based in reality as of now. So we have to make sure Israel has to make sure uh, locally and internationally that they're making the right moves, not just uh, militarily, which Israel's doing a great job, but also um, politically, internationally, politically, and in terms of the PR. We have to make sure that we're right. doing a job better job in that and explaining what it is that needs to be done over there 
But it feels to me as if the Israeli determination is so profound that even if the world turned its back, the war would still need to be won because this is Israel's security. This is the lives of Israeli children and Israel's, Israel's future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I, I don't think Israel is, uh, can, I don't think any country can go at it alone these days. The world is so intertwined. I don't think anybody thinks that any single country, Israel or Denmark, for that matter, can go at an enemy on their own. And I think that it's all about international alliances and connections and stuff that is being closed, you know, d decided in closed doors. And I hope this happens here as well. Look, the problem with entities like Hamas, like ISIS, like Hezbollah, like is that they are not just a military operation. They are an idea. And that idea of jihadism needs to be eradicated. So it's not just about Hamas's military capabilities, it's about the world understanding, and the UK needs to think of that long and hard, right? Because we know what's happening in the UK and all over Europe right now. Things long and hard, how do we eradicate this horrible idea of jihadi radicalism, which is threatening not just Israel, but the entire world? Because again, when they say it, we need to believe it. And that's what they're saying. After it's after world domination, it's after you know this is a war to the death as far as they are concerned, and we have to make sure that that idea is stopped. So how that is done, I'm not sure, but this is also a very long game that uh, Israel and the West will have to play when it comes to that culture. So Israel needs its friends, and I suppose this comes down to the next or brings me to the next. And final topic I wanted to discuss with you. You know, whenever I do events in the Jewish community and there are questions at the end, they always tend to revert to what can we do about? Mm -hmm. What can we do about campus uh, and symptoms on campus? What can we do about the UN? What can we do about bias at the BBC? What can we do about? And it's a very difficult question to answer. Do you get that question yourself as well? All the time. <laughs> and what's your answer to that? Well, my answer to that, first of all, my answer to that, because a lot of the times I get, because I'm so active online, a lot of the time uh, people are asking me, how do we become more active online? And I tell them, you don't, it's irrelevant. I always say, and I'll say this to your viewers and listeners as well, the best way to do it is analog, not digital. So the best way to... Um, uh, fight against anti-Semitism bias at the BBC is call BBC, email the BBC, go there, send letters. The best way to fight against anti-Semitism is create a community Shabbat and invite your friends and colleagues and your yoga friends and whoever isn't Jewish to like celebrate Shabbat, like be more open and more welcoming. I say that this is um, this is the best way to do it and be and fight smart. You don't, it doesn't matter what you post online. If you got 60 followers that are your family, it's irrelevant. Just use it as your family album. You don't have to be like, Rah, and don't get into like, Twitter fights with trolls, it's completely irrelevant, but every single one of us has an ability to affect even like two people. So that's what we need to go out and do. And in terms of campuses, definitely fight that. Call the deans, call the, the faculty, you know, try to ban SJP on campus. Stop donating to these universities. Take the money away. Go Send the kids to universities that do support the Jewish community. Be active about this. Stop playing that game. It's not, we're not going to win it. We need to um, think of what's happening right now from, again, a generational point of view, from like, this is this is just another one of these events of thousands of years, thousands of years of Jewish existence. And we're going to survive that one too. But we have to be actively out there in every way that we possibly can. And one of the things that I, that I tell people is, is never forget that they have an advantage and we have an advantage. Their advantage is the numbers. There's always going to be more of them than there are of us. But our advantage is that we happen to be right. <laughs> exactly. We happen to be right, and we happen to be right over and over and over again historically, too. So right. we're like... Right. It's not our first road. So, remember, this is not the first time that this has happened to the Jewish community. We all know this on a DNA level. I've seen, I've seen the Jewish DNA kicks into action in the most extraordinary of ways, from young to old. People are saying, "Heck no!" and and kind of like an old roar is coming back to life to be like, "All right, here we go, bring it on," and you know, and we'll do what needs to be done. So, just finally, what can people take away with them in terms of? optimism what grounds for 
brightness and energy can you can you give people to take forward into their lives and and make the world a better place this is the optimism that i'm that i'm talking about this is something if we don't think of it as in oh my god look at what's happening to us right now and we think about it as oh what's happening to us it happened to our forefathers many 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 generations before and now we're it's up to us to fight against it then it is it's liberating in a way it's not um this is this would be something that you can kind of look at and go, all right, I, it's my turn to to fight this. And when you look back at history, we know how this ends. So it's not. I'm I'm beyond optimistic. I say this a lot, and I I no matter what happens in we're always going to be around. We've, we're going to win this one too. And not only are we going to survive this, we're going to thrive this. So we have. The Jewish community, the Jewish people, the Israelis, the Jewish people around the world, we have, it's a concept that I heard from my sister and my niece, both studied um, psychology. There's a concept called post-traumatic growth. And as soon as I heard that, I intuitively immediately knew what this was. And I was like, oh, of course, this is great. This is literally what the Jewish community does and have been doing for generations. So instead of focusing on our post-trauma that is coming up, on uh, our generational trauma that is coming up, focus on the post-traumatic growth that we know how to tap into. And once we tap into that, we shore up our community, we root ourselves deeper in our Jewish identity, celebrating who we are, being more loud and more proud, and this too shall pass. And not only are we going to learn from it, the world's going to learn from it over and over and over again, because again, that's what we're here to do. So we're just going to keep doing that. I'll just be on that note thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening thank you for having me